Hi, and welcome to this episode of Chess for Life in the Time of Corona. Today, we are delighted to have FIDE Master Steve Giddens with us. Steve is a writer and translator, and one book he wrote recently was with Gerard Welling, Sidestepping Mainline Theory. Here it is. Steve, you can hold up the book. Yeah. There you go. Fantastic book uh, by Steve about how you can learn openings and avoid having to learn too much stuff. Uh, Steve also uh, has a coaching success in that he coached Grandmaster Matthew Sadler. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you. Well, nice to be here. Steve, can you uh, give us a bit about your background in chess, how you got into chess and what it means to you? Yeah, I, um, I started playing when I was about, well, I started playing seriously when I was about 12, basically in the aftermath of Fisher's Fasti. I think before that, that I, I'd known the moves and played for a few months and scored against someone and then lost interest. But I, I, about the time I went to grammar school in probably 72 as well. Um, and the Fisher Spassky match got me really interested in chess. And then one of the guys in the first year at school was quite a keen player and played a lot with his grandfather and he was a, a reasonable player. Um, and so I used to play with him and I, I started getting serious basically to, to, to avoid losing to him. You know, I started getting books out of the library and then yeah. looking at the game like, to improve and it really went from there. I joined a club in um, late 73 um, I, you know, pretty much played, um, became quite fanatical about it for, for the next 20, 30 years or whatever. Did you, did you play a lot of tournaments in your time? Yeah, I mean, a lot of weekenders. Um, at one point, especially in the 80s um, and early 90s, I was playing weekenders quite fanatically. I mean, I would meet a, a friend of mine who was also like me, um, you know, single and just played chess as a main hobby where he was relatively weak player. He was only graded at about 100 something. But we used to play a lot of weekend tournaments, including a lot in the north of England, which is where he originally came from. And we used to drive all around the country playing these things. And at times, at the height of it, it got to the point where we were playing two or three weekends a month for a you know, large chunk of the year. Yeah, so, I think there are a lot of chess players like that who get completely hooked at some point and yeah. play at every opportunity. Yeah, and there were a lot of tournaments then, and these were almost all um, slow play tournaments, not many of them, but there were a few rapids, but the majority were five or six round normal um, weekenders, um, but there were, I think there were a lot more around at that time than there are now, mm. and they were quite well attended as well, I mean, you you know, you'd turn up and there'd be 40, 50 people in the, in the open, whereas, you know, in recent years, whenever I've been to a weekend tournament, you're lucky if there's a 10 or 15 in the open. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it was it was quite a golden era in terms of um, you know the tournaments. The Grand Prix was still running. There were still guys like Hebden and, and Arkham and people like this who were playing professionally and you know and able to make a living from it. Yeah, and and you moved to Russia at some point. Yeah, I'd um, I'd always been interested in, in Russia partly because of the chess and also just. You know, when I did O-level history, we did Russian Revolution and so on. So I'd always had an interest in it. And I'd even started trying to learn a bit of Russian in the early 90s, about 1990, in an evening class. And just Was that because of chess? Mainly, yeah. I, you know, I had chess magazines and books that I'd had for years, and I'd always been able to sort of decipher the names and the notation and understand a half a dozen words about black designs or draw a greed or something, but that was about it. And then I had time you know, my hands and decided I'd try and actually learn the language properly. And I started working on it. And then, um, late 1992, I got the opportunity to work in Russia because Coopers and Leibrand, who I was working for, just opened an office in Moscow. And um, they were looking for a tax manager there. So <laughs> I had that opportunity. I put in for it and got the job. Um, and obviously I wanted to take advantage of the chance to get some proper coaching because I'd never really had any real coaching. I'd done a little bit of work with John Levitt over here a few times. But apart from that, I'd never really had any systematic coaching. And so I managed to arrange that when I was in Moscow and I worked for several years with um, an IM called Igor Belov. Um, 
and he'd been one of the assistant trainers at the Dvoretsky Yusupov School, and he knew everybody in Moscow he was very well regarded guy. Um, so, yeah, he was really useful and helped me a lot, and also introduced me to a lot of people. So you met all the, a whole lot of top players out in Russia? Not, not so much many of the top players, but I met a lot of the, the guys who were well-known locally in Moscow, a lot of local masters who played in the blitz tournaments every every time every every week and i met one or two others i mean there were you know people like Dvoretsky and uh, one or two others i met um and did you play a lot of chess yourself when you were out there blitz I didn't play an awful lot because i was you know i was working full time okay. and we were very busy i mean it was the time when all the western investment was pouring in so we were really busy at work um, so I actually played very little, apart from a few. They they always had a 15-minute blitz tournament at the Central Chess Club every Sunday, and I used to play in those reasonably regularly, especially at first. Um, and you'd get a few IMs and Masters there, um, but um, apart from that, I didn't really get a chance to play much there. But what I tended to do is all of my holidays. You know, I spent going abroad and playing in tournaments. So I was playing in places like Galveston and various uh, foreign tournaments in holidays, and then working on chess at weekends um, with uh, with Eco. Mm, very good. And and did you watch chess improve then during that time? Yeah, I did. I mean, I I'd already qualified. I I became an FM before I went there because I um I qualified for the British Championship in about eighty seven. I think the British seven. I think it was. Um, and I did especially well in that and the Lloyds Bank and some other event to get a FIDO rating. I played enough games to get a rating and it was just over 2,300. So I got the FM title. So your first rating got you FM? Yeah, but as I say, I, 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 you know, I didn't play that. I mean, it was virtually the first internationals I'd played. I mean, I'd been, I'd been sort of 190, 200 strength in ECF terms for, for about 15 years before that. Mm. But I, um, you know, I never really played much, um, rated events um until until then but yeah i mean i gained i gained something like 100 rating points in the time i was in russia over the course of a couple of years yeah as i think a result just of, soaking like, up the russian atmosphere will gain you some points just by being there it's yeah so it was inspiring and also i just you know it was i got some systematic work on the game and after that i'd always spent loads of time looking at chess but i was looking at chess rather than working on chess and, um, you know, I think I said in one of the books, which I, I dedicated one of my books to Igor, um, and I said that he was the guy who taught the difference between a serious player and a player who works seriously at chess. And I'd always been a serious player, but I'd never really worked in a serious and systematic way. I had virtually no opening repertoire. I used to just play something I'd seen in, in Informata a few months earlier. I had no properly systematised opening repertoire or anything like that. And I didn't really study things like practicing calculation and, and and stuff of that of that kind really i spent most of my time looking at books and playing through games but i wasn't really working very systematically and okay. that really made the difference when i went to russia i guess oh, that's very interesting yeah so and then so that that brought about your increase in strength yeah i just you know i just found that i was going to these tournaments and i was able to to yeah to to play a lot better and i was able to put up this you know decent games against title players as well. I mean, I, you know, I was finding I was, I got to the point where I was playing IMs and even GMs in these times and not feeling that, you know, that I was necessarily going to lose. Yeah. And I actually started to, you know, to, to get to the point where I was, I was holding them all for a lot of the time and beating them sometimes as well. So, yes, it was, it was nice. I mean, I certainly improved quite a lot. And what was it like coaching the young Matthew Sadler? <laughs> Uh, well, that, that was incredible because I've never really done any coaching. I mean, all that happened was because Matthew lived locally, because Matthew lived locally, he came along to the chess club one time, the local club with his parents. Um, and you know, we'd never seen him. Well, he only just learned the moves, I think, shortly before that. How old was he at that stage? Seven, I think. Yeah, seven or eight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I do remember quite vividly, I'm not wanting to embarrass him, but I do remember the very first time he came. He sat and played. It wasn't me. He played. It was some other guy, Brian Cochran, who was he'd been one of the, the better players in the area for years, and he was about 160, 170. And he sat there, and this this kid was just making incredibly natural 
decent looking moves. And Brian, Brian eventually won, but we looked at this, you know, after about 15, 20 moves, you'd have thought, well, this guy's, this kid's obviously a good 150 strength. And it turned out, you know, he just learned the moves. So it was quite striking. And then um, Matthew's father um, came to me a few couple of weeks later and said they were looking for a coach and there wasn't, you know, there wasn't actually anyone who's actually a, a recognised coach, of course, in the area. But, but they asked me if I would, would work with him. So... How, how did you what did you what did you teach him um well i think we started off learning some openings because he knew absolutely none at all i mean he just literally just learned the moves and just it was already very very natural and was just putting these pieces on with squares very quickly and naturally but yeah we talked we learned um just looked at a few openings i think i took lots of gambits actually yeah i seem to remember taking more gambits and the heavy shara yeah Everything. Yeah, gambits and everything. It's true, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, and then obviously, yeah, the, the, the other thing with Matthew was that he was incredibly hard work and enthusiastic, um, and that makes a huge difference. You know, I would give him, I'd give him a few notes on a couple of sheets of, of A4 on some of these openings with a few games, and then, you know, a week later, he'd, he'd absolutely absorbed it totally. Um, and so obviously he made very quick progress. Um, and yeah. within a year or so, I think you won you won some British under tens or elevens or whatever it was. Yeah. yeah he did, he was, did you get to was, the stage where he was beating you? Well, yeah, it, it very quickly got to the stage where you know the BC the BCF as it was got got interested at that point, and then I think they 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 got. Was it Danny King they got, or was either Danny King or Nigel Davis was? Yeah. Was we? that point it was already getting to the point where you needed somebody stronger yeah danny king was my first uh was my first uh yeah i am coach you could say it was uh but actually um um it wasn't uh, it was uh so uh, steve helped as well and there was also a guy called uh, john smith who was uh another strong player at the club um and uh so steve used to um yeah, very nice guy. Steve used to uh, to give me all these lovely sheets of information and all that with uh, loads of classic games and all that. And uh, John used to play a lot of games against me. So um, he was about 190 strength. He was a good player. And uh, But the thing that he did r really nicely, John, was that he... Um, so he'd play a, a position for a while and then he'd, you know, he'd gradually outplay me and all that. And then he said, OK, we'll turn the board round and now you've got to try and uh, beat me and stuff like that. It was very... Uh, you know, it was, and it was a lovely combination, you know, because I got all the structured stuff from uh, from Steve, and um, and um, I also got um, you know a lot of practice just against a, a strong player playing against John as well. So it was. Uh, so Steve prepped you for playing John. <laughs> well, that was that was kind of how it was working, really. It was, uh, but it's, it's great. I mean, uh, yeah. I'm... Sorry, it wasn't, it wasn't specific preparation. <laughs> yeah, I suppose I'll. Feeding of ideas, openings, and things like that, which he was then trying out against John. Yeah, no, it's. Uh... You also, Steve, you also helped in uh, getting Matthew a chance to meet Varetsky. Well, yeah, I mean, as I said, I I met Varetsky via uh, my my trainer Eagle, and um, it was about what ninety four probably, um, and Matthew had become a GM, but uh, he was kind of stuck around twenty five something. Yeah. Um, and he was, you know, working incredibly hard, um, and the results weren't quite coming. And it was, I'd watched him one or two times. I remember at Hastings that year, um, and I watched most of the games and many of the post-mortems. And it was, it was quite frustrating because Matthew was seeing five times more than any of his opponents, most of them were GMs, and yet, you know, his results were not, you know, his results were not that outstanding in the tournament. I think he got around 50 percent or something in the premier and i just had the feeling that all it needed was there was something there was like some key needed just to unlock mm. this this what i thought was a huge potential like i like you know i had the feeling it was really like 2600 plus in terms of what he was seeing but it just wasn't translating into results and so i had the idea that maybe dredsky would be the guy who could probably put his finger on what was wrong and so, you know, I suggested it, and it, you know, Matthew was obviously very keen. So then I, I approached Dredsky and asked him. Um, and I think you'd met before, hadn't you? Because you'd both been yeah. second in Lothian. Yeah, just you know, briefly, before. yeah, yeah. And when I when I mentioned it to Mark, he was extremely enthusiastic immediately because he was very choosy about who he'd work with. 
I mean, he wouldn't work with anyone who he didn't think was was taking it seriously enough or was hard working enough. And yeah, anyone who liked drinking or running around with women or gambling or anything like this, he wasn't going to touch. So he was a bit, he was quite like Paul Vinnie like this. He was quite a, a bit of a Puritan. Um, but when I when I suggested you know working with Matthew, he was immediately very enthusiastic and said, "Oh yes, I met him." At, yeah, with Loti, I am, yes, very impressed with him, very serious young man. Yes, definitely, I'd love to. So, yeah, we managed to arrange for him to, or for Matthew to come to Moscow for a couple of weeks or a week, a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah. Sessions, I think. Yeah, it was fantastic. It was fantastic. Yeah. Also, one character, he was, he was a funny guy, he was a brilliant trainer, but he was a very, he was almost uh, the image of the classic, kind of nerdy kind of chess player who was brilliant at chess but really quite unworldly you know he was he was hopeless at anything practical like I don't know if Matthew can confirm but you know when they they work at, at Dreski's flat when while his wife was out of work um, she'd sort of leave them some lunch with detailed instructions of how to warm it up in the microwave and you know every day Dreski would nearly set the flat on fire and come back to <laughs> so yeah it was quite funny Mark. A lovely, he was a lovely guy, Mark, and a really brilliant. His, his insights into the game were immensely impressive. He was, he was quite a character. He couldn't, he couldn't do anything for himself. And again, Igor told me that whenever Mark went on one of his foreign trips to do coaching abroad and stuff like this, his wife had to do everything. She had to go down. She had to book his tickets. She had to get his visa sorted. She had to put him on the train and put him on the aeroplane and, and more or less everything like because he was really impractical at anything like this. Uh, so it was, yeah, it was kind of, uh, it was fun time actually. Yeah, no, it was, it, it was amazing. It was amazing actually. I've never worked as hard as uh, as I have during that time because, uh, so you know, I was, I was I was staying at Steve's flat and then uh, so in the evening, you know, Steve would come back and uh, I'd have this homework from Doretsky and uh, you know just just working, uh, you know, hours and hours deep into the night trying to solve these things, you know, and uh, it was really, yeah, no, it was uh, it was it was amazing, but it was it was. It made it uh, made massive massive difference, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's always been the thing that, that nobody in England had access to, and they, yeah. they really were. They were strong players who did a bit of coaching, but they weren't any proper coaches in that yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. Is the problem why we didn't develop more? more you know, I mean, what we did achieve in the seventies, eighties was was actually phenomenal when you yeah. consider that there was no structure. I mean, nobody, even guys like Nicky Adams, anyone, nobody had any real training. I mean, mm. Nicky, Nicky said he had a few sessions as a little kid with Peter Clark. Um, and then he, he, I think he had a handful of sessions with Spielman for a while. Mm. But, you know, again, Spess was a very strong player, a really good analyst, but he wasn't really a, a strong yeah. Yeah. trainer. Yeah, yeah. Structure's yeah. not the word you think of. Uh, no, that comes to mind with Brilliant, but not structured. Yeah. yeah. And of course, when it came to opening preparation, again, you know, it wasn't exactly Spessy's forte. Um, John Nunn perhaps was better in that regard, was more was more theoretically geared up. But yeah, really, most of these guys of, of that generation they had to do it all themselves. Yeah, yeah. Now, Steve, we're, we're, we're talking to you on the 27th of May, 2020. Um, coronavirus has, has, has been huge in the, I mean, worldwide in the UK, uh, we've struggled with it immensely actually um, we have been in lockdown now lockdowns gradually easing uh, how, have, how have you found the last few months? I've actually been very fortunate because it's not really made a huge difference to my, my daily lifestyle in, in most respects um, I am, I've long since been retired um, I live alone um, I you know, my typical daily routine be just sort of walk into Rochester, which is about a mile away, do a bit of shopping, move around some second-hand bookshops, have a cup of coffee, and then come home and spend the rest of the day either translating or working on chess or re or reading, listening to radio, or whatever. So really, apart from not being able to get the really really the coffee in the high street and not being able yeah. to buy the second-hand bookshops, it's not really changed that much you know most of the routine has been pretty similar and in that sense i'm very lucky i mean i'm as i say i'm retired i'm comfortably off financially without being hugely rich mm. but i've got i've not had any financial worries about paying bills or anything like that i don't have to worry about whether i'll have a job to go back to yeah. so obviously i'm very very fortunate yeah and have you do you still do any chess coaching i have one 
on TV in Love with uh, a little bit with Kevin Winter. Who yeah, had yeah. On the, oh yes, yes, of course. Uh, a few weeks ago, and I've I've had one or two other few amateurs um, that I've done a bit of coaching with, but not a lot. Um, but I, I have been looking more at chess, interestingly. I mean, I, in the last few years, I'd, my interest in enthusiasm for open book chess had almost completely gone. It had got to the point where I'd, you know, I didn't even follow the tournaments very much. Um, and in fact, last year, I even sold off my, my chess library, as Matthew knows. Yeah. But I sold it off and I'd, I'd basically not looked at a chess book and played through a game for several years. I almost completely lost interest. The only chess I was looking at, apart from when I was working on something, was, was chess problems, which I'm still mm. you know, yeah. interested in. But I, I have been looking again a bit more at chess during the last few months, and I have dug out here one of the few handful of books that I did keep. And I've been looking back through a few games and you know doing some stuff even independently of the book that I'm currently writing. So um, it has actually made some difference to my my interest in the game. Okay. Yeah. And we've been treated to lots of um, good tournaments online as, as well. Yeah, I mean, again, I've watched a bit of that. Um, I'm not a huge fan of these graphics, especially the blitz stuff online. I mean, I, I, I. I am rather a traditionalist. I'm a bit mm. crusty about these things. I I kind of have a, a nostalgic yearning from the days when you know you followed the World Championship match by buying the, the newspaper the next day to find out where it moves. Like I did in '78, for example, when it was the carpet for Kuchner, you know. Um, and so, I mean, we're very lucky that we can follow them live and commentary and in real time and everything. But um, I don't particularly like the rapid and blitz. Mm. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm a bit of a cop. Yeah, I've never been overly enthusiastic about frantic, rapid blitz stuff, but I have watched a bit of the one, especially the one that's going on at the moment that Carlson is playing in. And he, um, there's no doubt he's immensely impressive. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, this Dubov guy has been really quite a revelation. Yeah, completely crazy. I mean, it's really. I, I don't. Uh, I don't understand how he did that to uh, to carry Arkin really. To carry Arkin really. Ooh. No, I mean it, it's very reminiscent to Morozovich in his younger days. Yeah, yeah. He was doing the play. He was playing these quite quite offbeat, striking looking openings, and you know, really wreaking havoc for a while. But he wasn't able to do it against the very best players in classical chess, of course. And I, I suspect that may prove to be the case with Dubov. But a rapid and blitz type stuff is obviously a, a tremendous hand for me. Got you know great create, creativity. Yeah, yeah, I know. Amazing ideas, amazing ideas. So, Steve, you're now in lockdown and self isolation, and um, in a, in our coronavirus world, uh, you can take one game of chess with you. Uh, which game have you chosen, and why? Well, I've chosen my. Uh... My Evergreen um, and Immortal basically rolled into one. It's about the only really decent game I've ever played against a, a really strong opponent. Um, it was against um, Vaganyan, the Armenian GM, in um, 1996. Um, it was played at the Lost Boys tournament in Antwerp, which I used to play in pretty much every year. Um, and it was very much my favourite event. Um, and I... Um, I, I played Vagignon in round two. I think I'd won. I'd won first round against some a local a local player about twenty two hundred. And then the next day I had Black against Vagignon, um, who was at that time he was no longer sort of competing at world championship or candidate level, but he was still he was over twenty six hundred and he was he had a pretty fearsome reputation. He I think the year before he'd scored something like fourteen and a half out of fifteen or something in the Bundesliga. Yeah. It, you know, he was one of the top scorers in those days in the Bundesliga and other um, league events in Europe and he was yeah, he was playing very, very well. So um, yeah, that was quite a, he was the strongest player probably that I'd actually played in a in a proper one one to one game. Um, you managed to chalk up a win. I managed to chalk up a win, yeah, with um, with the hedgehog, the greatest <laughs> the greatest opening system ever really. But, <laughs> well it is when it works. <laughs> but you now I don't have certain fondness for the hedgehog. 
and I'd, I'd had some good results with it, but obviously that was the far away the best of them. But it was one of those things I was, you know, as you'll see, it was a, there was a, a significant slice of luck. But then, if you're if you're my strength, then you need a bit of luck if you're going to beat Vader and you Well, Steve, thank you very much. Uh... For, for appearing on the program and we'll now have a look at that game. Okay. Okay, let's have a look at this game. So uh, this was Sir Raphael Vagagnan, extremely strong player, uh, against Steve Giddings, also a very strong player. So uh, let's have a look. The game started. He started. Uh, did he start knight f3? Yeah, knight f6. Knight f6, yeah. C4, e6, knight c3, c5, c5, yeah. B. Bishop g2, bishop b7. So it's pretty standard uh, hedgehog stuff here. And I played a6. Now he played rook e1. <clears throat> and um, this, this is. Well, he's still, I think, still regarded as the strongest line. Um, rather than playing d4 and queen takes, the idea is to play e4 and then d4 and take the knight. Yeah. Um, I'd only actually met this once before, um, which was some years earlier, and I, on that occasion, I, I'd managed to lose in 14 moves after blundering in the opening. Oh dear. Um, and that was against Simon Knott as well, just to add insult to injury, it's a really unpleasant experience. Um, so my main motion was to make sure I did a bit better this time. Um, I looked at it in the morning and found that, you know, on the database, and Bagignan had a huge plus score. He had over a dozen games where he'd won in this line. Okay. So I knew, I knew this was what he was going to play. I had an idea that I'd, I'd sort of planned a few months earlier that I was going to play based on a game that had been in Infinitra, um, a game actually won by uh, Bob Marin, uh, the oh, yeah. Canadian GM, Mick Hyman. And so I did, decided to follow that. So I think I played Bishop E7. E4, D6, takes, takes. takes and now he's threatening e5, so you have yeah. to go queen c7. Um, and he played bishop e3, and again, you can't you can't take this pawn on c4 because the rook c1 and knight d5 is horrendous. Yeah, it's absolutely, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's huge, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so this is all standard. So instead of that, I just castled, um, he played rook c1. And now this is the the first real point because normally one plays knight bd7 here and that is in fact nowadays i think the main line and is regarded as okay but the, the point of the idea that mary played was was to keep this knight back um and have the option of putting it on c6 okay yeah. white's going to go white's going to go g4 g5 in a minute so the idea is to leave d7 free for the other knight but of course you have to you have to time knight c6 in such a way you don't walk into knight d5 yeah so um so i played rookie eight okay f4 uh bishop f8 yeah and g4 and this is all standard and this had all happened in the married game against schwarzman now unfortunately on the morning of the game although i remembered having decided i was going to play this Marion line. I couldn't actually find the game on my database that morning. Um, and, and this shown because in this position I should have played knight f d seven immediately. Okay. The idea of knight c six. If you play knight c six and one is still knight d five. So I should go knight f d seven. Yeah. So this is very not pleasant. So yeah. if I go knight f d seven and then if, if he goes say g five, um and then knight d6 is now possible because now after knight d5 I can just go queen b8. Yeah, yeah, and you're uh, and you're fine. Yeah. Unfortunately, I misremembered it, and instead of knight f7, I played g6, which is kind of a typical hedgehog move. But actually, in this position, is not not so good because it weakens f6. Um, and I immediately realised I'd gone wrong because Vagnon sort of curled his lip in the most disgusting. <laughs> Um, so I thought, oh dear, something's got slightly wrong here. So he went g5. Um, I played knight 7. And he went b3. And now I got a bit worried that if knight c6, knight d5, queen b8, maybe knight f6 is... is okay, yeah, yeah. 
I can uh, see, what, so, see what you I mean. I started like a couple of six, so I went, I yeah. instead, inst yeah, it's vision like a six is a bit unpleasant, I don't really want to allow this. So I played bishop g7, and of course this means my d6 pawn is, is now weaker than it should be. Yeah. Um, so he went knight d2, and he's really just following his standard plan anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, finally, I went knight c6. So again, knight d5, queen b8 is okay. Yeah. He went, instead, he went um, rook e d8. Sorry, rook e d1. Yeah. So queen, so queen d2, knight c5, rook e d1. And, and rook... now I play rook, rook a d8. Yeah. Which again, is, you more often want this the rook on c8. But okay, I did this. Was he trying to punish you for your uh, misremembering of the opening? Um, yeah, he has a bit in the sense that he's induced me to put my bishop on g7 a little bit early. I mean, I think actually, if he played instead of knight d2 at move 17, if he plays queen d2 in that position, I think this is actually more effective because then he's he's getting to the d. If knight c6, he can just take and go rook d1. And, okay, yeah. Uh, fox so I think that's actually more accurate. But he was he was moving pretty quickly and with you know with, with a confidence bordering on how I can tell. He's not surprised. No, I, mean, I don't blame him. I mean, it was just a walk in the park for him, really. I mean, he's he's used to crushing better players than me in this life. So he was obviously you know totally confident. It was just going to be a normal day at the office. Um, so he went knight g three. I played queen b eight. And now he played rook b1. Going for b4, I guess. Yeah, um, and again, with a, with a sort of shrug, as if to say this is just ridiculously easy. And obviously this is now getting quite serious, because b4, knight d7, potentially d6 is hanging. Yeah. So, I played... Um, I played... Bishop a8. B4, knight D7. Now at the moment C3 is, is hanging, so he can't actually take the D6. So he went A3. And at this point, you know, I was, you know, I was aware that I was just being pushed around a bit here, and um, this wasn't going quite as planned. But I, I thought, well, now I can go B5, which is the one of the breaks one always yeah. has to get in. So okay, I played B5, and he took. And then he just played rook b c one. And really only now, this is what I mean when I was a bit lucky, because it was really only now I think what was what was really going on. Because I'd seen this and thought, well I'm coming knight b six. And yeah, you know, potentially getting into c four. But after this I thought, oh well now he's taking on b five. But then I've got d five and I thought, well, you know, I'm I'm breaking out here. But of course, it now dawned on me that what he was actually going to do was get the exchange up on c4 and stick his knight on d6. So this is what he did actually, wasn't it? It was d5, e5. Yeah. He went knight c4. Yeah. But when I, when, I, when I got to the position of the rook bc1, you know, having, having up to then thought, well, this surely is going quite well now for me. Only now did I realise, oh, crikey, he's got this plan of putting his knight on d6. But I, luckily, it was obviously one of those days, because I had a bit of inspiration almost immediately, and I, I saw the key sacrifice, which I played a few minutes later, and it turned out it's actually all quite good. But I was a little bit lucky, because if it doesn't work, I'm already dead in the water. Because I can't play knight b6, you know, it's not looking very good. Yeah. So, it happened, it all worked out. So I played knight b6 coming into c4, so he really has to take and now d5. He plays e5. Again, it's pretty much forced. I play knight c4. He has to take on c4. And then plays knight d6. And this was as far as he'd seen. This is the point of his idea. And of course, if I have to play something like rook e7 or something, anything quiet, he's just going to round up the c4 pawn and shove his queenside pawns down. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm obviously getting crucified. But in this position, I hit him with, with my, my surprise, uh, of, which I calculated a few lines. I played knight takes e5. Nice. Um, and this, this obviously came as a total shock. 
because he was absolutely speechless after the game. <laughs> um, so I'd seen some lines here, but I, I, as I say, I was a bit lucky in the sense that if this doesn't work, then actually I've had it anyways. So I've kind of been outplayed, but as it happens, this works. The first point is if he takes on E5, the line I had seen was Bishop takes E5, so D6 is threatened. D6. So you have to, you have to, you have to. Then I take on G2. He must take the king to stay on the D file. Then I have C3, Queen D3, and C2. And he has to come off the D line and lose the knight on D6. Okay. So that much I had, I had seen before before I played knight B6. So instead of the knight E5, he has to play bishop takes A8. Mm -hmm. oh. time I'd intended the move that I played, which was C3, but a computer, I, I noticed the other day, points out knight G4 is also a very strong. Oh, good lord. Season. Yeah, they may even be better than what I played. There are a lot of pieces hanging, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but I, I played C3, which is also a good move. So obviously the first point is he can't take on C3 because of knight F3 check. Do you like that? Um, so he has to he has to move the queen somewhere and I expected Queen E two defending the bishop on E three. When I'd intended that I can play in this position, rook takes D six. Okay, and he um, takes I guess. He takes, I take. F takes. Um, he takes on E five, I take him to bishop. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, he goes bishop to g2, and now something like rook d8. Yeah, yeah, this is going to be quite... Or rook c8, yeah. and yeah, I've got, he's got two pieces for the for the rook, but this pawn on c3 is a monster, and he's actually in a lot of trouble here. Yeah, yeah. So, this is what I expected, but instead, very quickly after c3, he played queen c2. And I looked at this and I thought, my first thought was, what the hell is he doing? I, I can go, I, thought, I can go rook d6 and knight c4 and all of his pieces are hanging. Surely this is just winning. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, come on, this is Dragon Yard. This can't be this easy. Hang. So I started calculating feverishly and every time I had calculated it, I thought, I'm just winning. And then my heart said, no, 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 you must be missing something. You must be missing something. So I had several minutes of this turmoil. When all of a sudden he leant across and offered me a draw. No! Oh! <laughs> In my time, the internet. But this was actually a huge psychological mistake because the moment he did that, I thought, oh my god, I am winning. <laughs> I knew that I was winning. <laughs> and the problem is, of course, C, Queen on C2 leaves E3 hanging as well. So I sort of, you know, spent a few minutes calming myself down and checking everything. And then I, I replied, I, I suppose sneaky replied to him in Russian and say, no, I would to play on. <laughs> Which just caused him a bit, bit more surprised because he hadn't realised that until then when he was in Russia. So I played with d6. And basically, he has to take and I play knight c4. Ah, uh, this is huge. Yes. So I'm a minor piece down, but he's got two minor pieces and a rook hanging. Yeah. If, if he goes rook d3, I play e3. And then if he captures back, I can actually go bishop d4 is even better than taking on a own. Yeah, yeah. It just wins the whole so house. He's basically, he's completely busted now. Um, he played rook a6. And the rest of it was just about making sure I didn't screw it up, which was, I mean, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't difficult to finish off. But the fact is that 12 months earlier in the same tournament, I had a winning position against Larry Christensen and managed to lose it. So... I was kind of aware of that and determined I was going to make, make sure I put him, put him away this time. So I played in knight a z3. And the key thing about these positions, of course, is to keep the initiative. Because if you lose the initiative against a stronger player, they'll start making it difficult. But luckily, I've just got a series of hammer blows thanks to this pawn. So I played, first of all, c2. So now if he takes on e3, I have bishop d4. Oh, very nice, very nice. So he had to play... Um, he had to play knight e2 instead. Then I have 
Love a hammer blow, Queen B5. Ooh. <laughs> Basically, he took, um, he took an E3. Uh, I took an A6. So now the bishop's hanging out on threatening Queen takes E2. Yeah. Nasty. And your material up. Yeah, you had to go. And your pawn's about to Queen. <laughs> Yeah, so now I played rook d8, again threatening queen takes e2, and then bishop e2, bishop d4, and queen e. Yeah, yeah. Now you went king g2, um, and then I played bishop b2, threatening queen takes e2 for the third move for Rome, and this time he had to resign because now c1, queen a3 is just hopeless. Yeah, 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 this is just uh, completely gone. I played bishop b2 and I, I, the other thing that was funny was this was, on, this was played on about board seven or eight um, and um, Jeroen Piquet was on the top board I think or two ball two in the, in the next aisle and he, he was leaning over the ball looking at this in rather astonishment as I, as I played bishop b2 and, um, and then just looked at back in the aisle and smiled <laughs> I think he enjoyed it almost as much as I did um, and that was that so uh, that was that. So um, he had to resign. Yeah. And um, he was really gobsmacked, actually. He was really shocked because, you know, I tried to sort of, you know, as he signed the score sheet, I sort of looked and I said, well, you know, I was a little bit lucky to, to have this 95. And he just looked at me, he just sort of started saying, Night takes E5. Night takes E5. Astonish. I then wandered off looking really, really furious. Um, I like the nice touch about the Russian as well. well I just thought you were. Undercover Grandmaster. I was a little bit annoyed at him for offering me a draw in, you know, in my time. It was a bit naughty. Um, but yeah, so I thought, well, okay. And he, he, he said draw in English to me as well, so <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> um, but the funny thing was, for the rest of the tournament, he just completely blanked me every time he saw me. He looked yeah. as black um, which He was probably was, not I, very happy with this game, no. right? Fair enough. But the, the interesting postscript was 12 months later, we both played in the same tournament. And in the first round, I got up and left the board in the, uh, shortly after the game started. It was one of rounds. And I saw him. And he suddenly looked at me and burst into a broad grin and came rushing up and clasped my hands. <laughs> and he was absolutely right as rain throughout the rest of the tournament. <laughs> but it had obviously taken him a year to get over it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, because he, he, I mean, Vagagnon was a fantastic tactician, actually. That was the, the thing. He was so quick when he was uh, spectating on games and noticed, uh, I've, you know, witnessed it a few times that he was so, so quick, uh, you know, spotting tactics and all that. So, yeah, yeah he must have been. Um... I think probably when I played in IT5, I'm sure he realised even quicker than I did that he was actually losing. <laughs> but, um, but it was a huge shock. I mean, it was about lightning from a clear sky because really he'd been pushing me around and. By all, by all rights, he ought to have been, you know, winning this position. But it looks like knight e5 is actually, I think, the very best move for him after c3 is queen c1, which is, which is might be enough to to just about hang on. Oh, queen c1. Ooh, yeah. yeah because he's attacking c3 as well as, as defending e2. Okay. So in this, same line, in this same line, when I take a b6, he takes an e5. Yeah, okay, um, okay. Come on, it's a little bit. He can, he can, he can win C three and give up on G three. Yeah. And he might, he might have chances to hold that position. Although his king is quite bad, of course. But yeah. yeah, I mean that's probably what he should have done. Actually, I didn't discover that until some time later. But um, but he's he's certainly not winning. Um, yeah. No, and, and, I mean Black's Black's got all the fun, really, hasn't he? So. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a very nice example, and, and of course, you know, I managed to get him B5 and D5 and things one always wants to do in the Hedgehog, so it was very satisfying from that point of view. Yeah. But it was a little bit lucky, so I was I was a bit fortunate that by the time I spotted the idea of Knight E5, I was actually committed to playing it, because if it doesn't work, then I've had it by that point. Yeah, um, yeah. Because if I, if I, after Knight D6, I'm just going to get crushed if that doesn't work, so... Um, so there's that little bit of an element of luck, but um, well, I did count that a few lines, and you know I spotted my chances when it came along. Yeah, no, great, no, really, really lovely game. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, 
yeah, really no, almost a classic hedgehog actually. So, uh, you know, just really uh, actually quite unusual, quite unusual actually to, um, you know, when you play D5, the white plays E5, and then you sacrifice on, on E5 afterwards. That's uh, quite quite an unusual touch to it. It's, it's, it's pretty unusual from that point of view, yeah. Um, yeah, it was quite striking. I mean, he's, obviously what he's doing is very ambitious. So yeah. there is always the potential if he does, goes wrong for it to collapse. But even so, he won so many games with this system, playing playing this rookie one and G4, G5 and all the rest of it. Um, that, you know, he was well used to this. So, yeah, it came as a, as a real shock, I think, when, um, when this happened. But obviously, when he's you know round two of an opening in some twenty three fifty or whatever, he, he doesn't expect to have any problems really. No, um, no, it's true. Ah, he was wrong. <laughs> yeah, it looked like it was going very well for him early on, but it did. Yeah, it was quite shocking how you know, one relatively minor mistake and suddenly it you know, it really it really falls apart drastically, and he, there was no way back for him really. Yeah, no, indeed. Um, so he was quite unlucky. Oh, fantastic. Uh, thanks, Steve, for, uh, for showing us that game. Really good game. And, uh, yeah, well, uh, and thanks also for, uh, yeah, for, for being uh, interviewed and all that. And, uh, yeah, just uh, good, luck with, uh, good luck with your next book. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks for watching, everybody.